going to talk about the hidden side of our psychology. This is an interesting quote to start out today's class. Everyone has created a portrait of themselves, a portrait of an honest, charitable person, or insert an honest, charitable what it is that you think about yourself. We have adapted our existence according to that portrait, and from that portrait we act and react accordingly. We've talked about this a few times, but if we're, you know, if we're guilty of worshipping any golden idols, it's the golden idol of the self. We tend to place ourselves up on a pedestal and really cre create this non-realistic image of who we are and how we react to others and you know our position in life and that kind of stuff. The problem with that, though, is once we have this false image of who we are, everything we do is based on that image. Our whole life is spent acting and reacting according to who we think we are. And what we'll talk about when we uh, look at the course of this lecture today is just some of the problems that that leads to. We spend so much time uh, judging, criticizing, condemning other people, and really not much time doing that to ourselves. So we consequently, you know, look around and judge other people and what other people are doing while we walk around with this, you know, idealized self-image, this overinflated sense of self which we carry within. And that's a problem that creates all kinds of, uh, of uh, tensions and frustrations and suffering for humanity as well. And that's what we're looking at today. But it's just an interesting thing to reflect on that we all do have a portrait of who we think we are. And for many people, that portrait isn't close to the true reality of who we are. And we can see that in our friends and other people and co-workers that think of themselves a certain way. And we know that they're not really accurate. We, don't, we can see the problems they cause themselves and the situations that they get in with this unrealistic view of themselves. <clears throat> Just like the moon has a dark side, since the lunar background, it's a theme. Just like the moon has a dark side, a hidden side which is not seen, our psychology has a hidden or unknown side as well. When you just look at the moon, there's only a small portion of the room visible at any given time, depending on the phase of the moon itself. But the other thing to remember is because the moon basically rotates at the same rate as the Earth, we never really get to see the back of the moon. The moon always presents the same face to us. We have no idea what's going on the other side. Well, now we do, of course, when you know, we're going around and taking pictures of it. But for the longest time, we had no idea what was on the other side of the moon. The same thing like our psychology. We're only conscious as of, of a very small part of ourselves. Our personality only illuminates a very small aspect of which we are aware of. But that's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. It's a whole hidden side of our psychology that we're not even aware of. I don't mean necessarily dark-sided and you know nasty or, or bad or evil or something like that. I mean dark side is in non-illuminated, a side that our consciousness isn't capable of uh, penetrating inside. Therefore, we really don't know a lot about a huge part of our psychology. <clears throat> What that really means is within us, there's basically a hidden part of our psychology. What I mean by hidden part of our psychology, I'm talking about egos that are never visible to us. When you use the term an ego, and you talk about people having egos, when you think of your own personality, yes, there's some that you're aware of. You might think, okay, well, yes, yeah, sometimes I get angry, or sometimes I'm prone to this, or sometimes I'm prone to that. But we carry dozens of egos that we're not even aware of. And the problem with that remembering the egos become the forces which direct the ship of our life. So the egos become the wind and the waves that steer our ship. We're, these are like the puppet masters to which we dance. And that's why a big aspect of these studies is not only to, to identify and limit the egos, but also the egos that we carry in, in the hidden sense, the ones that we're not really aware of the ones that we're always excusing and the ones that we never really pay attention to that are still lurking in the background. So consequently, we live in a very small part of ourselves. Our consciousness, which is basically only 3%, remember we're 3% consciousness, 97% ego, that consciousness extends only to a very reduced part of ourselves. You can think of our psychology like a really big room with no lights. The consciousness is like a small candle that sits in the corner. That consciousness illuminates a very small area that we can see, but leaves a lot of the room dark. Our own psychology is like that. There's a small area around that consciousness that we can kind of perceive, but there's a lot of stuff moving in the darkness, moving in the shadows, that we're not really aware of. Part of this journey is, of course, to illuminate 
that dark area by developing that consciousness, turning that candle into a bigger and bigger flame until eventually it's a giant spotlight which illuminates the entire room, which illuminates our entire psychology, leaving no place for the ego to hide. We are only aware of a few of our most conspicuous egos. We have to discover the hidden ones. And that's, remember, the sneaky thing about the ego. It's like that famous quote, the biggest trick the devil played on humanity was convincing us that he never existed in the first place. We could really substitute the biggest trick the ego plays on us as really convincing us that it's not really there. And part of our goal in the awakening of consciousness is to discover really the full aspects of our psychology, discover all the different egos, because it's the egos that are responsible behind mo most of the motives and impulses and wants and desires and basically things that we do in our life. <clears throat> we have a hidden side. Why does this even happen? Well, if you look at it from a modern psychology point, the egos basically dwell in the subconscious. They dwell in that lower aspect of our psychology to which we have no conscious access. They basically live in that darkness. You've got the conscious aspect of yourself, which is the candle illuminating the small area. You've got the subconscious, which is the rest of the dark side of the room. The mind, the intellect, and reason cannot reach the profound depths of the subconscious. That's one of the problems that we're facing. When we look at intellect and reason, you remember basically those things are manifestations of the ego in the intellectual center. They serve a purpose and they allow us to do all kinds of really interesting things with our life, but they don't allow us to probe into that subconscious. That's why when we have sometimes challenges in life, we go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and they help us go in there by doing things like uh, looking at ink blocks, the Rorschach tests, um, by going in and talking about our dreams, childhood experiences, they help us unravel that aspect of our subconscious because we can't simply reason ourselves out of it. Think of somebody that's suffering a, a psychological problem like perhaps depression. You can't reason yourself out of depression. You can't just think yourself better because you have to get to the underlying reason that that is actually happening. So the mind and intellect and reason, they're powerful tools, but they don't help us get to the depths of the subconscious. We're going to need something more than that. When we look, I'll just briefly get into something else that we'll look at in detail later on. The mind has 49 levels. The mind that we have is actually very complicated. We have 49 levels, and don't forget that we occupy multiple bodies. We have a physical body, a vital body, an astral body, a mental body. So what we see is basically seven different levels times seven, giving us 49 stages or steps of our own psychology. What that means is, if we look at that analogy of, okay, the illuminated candle in the dark room, the illuminated candle is like one level, the dark room would have 49 steps outside of that. Okay, so the mind, when we look at it, you can see it as a house with 49 levels or a house with 49 rooms. When we look at us as a whole, we have to remember we're a lot more than this physical brain of flesh and blood in this physical body. We extend through multiple bodies. We've talked about the astral body and the mental body before. And when you kind of add up all the different bodies that we have and the different levels of consciousness, you end up arriving at 49 levels. And we'll be talking more about that in, in some classes coming up. So when we talk about the mind, that's one of the reasons why the ego is so complicated. That's why we have such a, a big subconscious aspect, is because the mind is not really simple. There's a lot of different levels to it. There's a lot of different rooms. Think of it as walking into a hotel, there's the main lobby which we can see, but then there's all these other rooms which you have no idea what's going on in. The mind is like that as well. The main lobby that you walk into, that's the conscious part of our mind. All the different rooms that are behind the scenes that you can't see, they're what makes up the subconscious. And just like walking into a hotel, you might see a few people standing around the lobby, there might be a concierge and someone behind the front desk, they would represent the egos that are visible to us. But inside that hotel, you have no idea who's in the rooms and what they're doing and what they're getting up to. You have no idea. You just know that there's a bunch of people in the hotel. You can't see them, though. Okay? What we want to do with the consciousness is go from room to room, basically <coughs> clearing it out until we can get rid of everybody in the hotel, leaving just us inside of it. Okay? So you can think of the mind as a, a house with many rooms inside. We're only ever aware of a few people that are coming in and out of the front lobby. We see them as we come out. We see them as they go in, but we don't know where they're coming from, we don't know where they're going, we don't know what room they're in. They're just visible to us as they pass in and out of that front lobby. Our consciousness is like that. 
We see eagles that are coming and going from time to time, but we really don't know where they came from, what they're trying to do, where they're going, and we don't even know how many there actually are and where they are, which different rooms they're residing in, and all that kind of stuff. The ego is basically the subconscious. When we dissolve the ego, the subconscious aspects of our psychology become conscious. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do when we talk about the awakening of the consciousness, we're talking about the elimination of the subconscious aspects of ourselves. Okay, basically shining the light of the consciousness and fully illuminating our entire psychology, taking away all these different hiding spots so we can really get to know who we actually are, what makes us tick. This all goes back to that statement that just won't go away, nasate ipsum right know thyself and this is part of the process of completely knowing ourselves not just knowing what's going on in that lobby but knowing what's going on in all those different hotel rooms going right in there and, and probing deeply inside our consciousness that would represent a state of continuous consciousness and that really is the state uh, of adept or the state of being a master Okay, the state of mastery. This is like a Jesus, a Buddha, something like that. Somebody who reaches the state of a master is basically living a state of continuous consciousness. Okay, they've got that spotlight shining, illuminating that entire room. They're fully aware of every thought, every action, every motive, and everything, all the motives, the impulses, the wants, the desires, all of it stems directly from the higher self, not from the ego. So someone with a state of continuous consciousness is in direct communication with their higher self. Everything they do, every thought, every emotion, every action is a direct manifestation of the will of the higher self as opposed to one of the various egos. We have many things inside us that we neither know or accept. And that's two different aspects of the same thing. There's many egos that we just are plain not aware of. They manifest in our behavior, perhaps our loved ones or people close to us can see them and manifest them, but we don't. The other aspect of this is sometimes we have egos that manifest and we know they're aware, we just don't accept them. We tend to rationalize their existence. We tend to say, well, I did this because of that, or it was because of this person, or because of the circumstances, or because, 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 because. That's what we do. Most people inherently aren't bad people. They don't want to do bad things but many people end up hurting a lot of other humans with their actions and then rationalize it later. Like they had no choice or the circumstances deemed it or they just weren't paying attention or even sensitive to their actions among other people. So it's not that we just have egos that we don't know. Many times there are certain egos that we probably have a good suspect or a good reason to suspect they exist, but we choose not to accept them. We choose to deny their existence and rationalize all the various things that happen when they manifest. These hidden aspects of our psychology, they complicate our lives. They provoke all sorts of undesirable situations for ourselves and the people around us. And these are things that could be avoided if we truly know ourselves. We can probably all think of an example for our own lives, be it a significant other, a good friend, a co-worker, where somebody has, has created a situation or caused problems just because they weren't aware of their actions. We say, like, why would they even do that? What were you thinking in the first place? Like, what did you think was going to happen? We can question their behavior, and that person is usually really shocked, and they really don't know. I, I don't know why I did that. I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. I don't really know what I was thinking. I was having a bad day. I was in a bad mood, etc., etc., etc. At the time, they really didn't know what they were doing. Something came forth within them, caused a certain situation, maybe they acted a certain way or did something or said something that later on they were shocked or embarrassed to actually discover something that was plainly obvious to everyone around them, but at the time they weren't able to, to avoid that situation. Okay, that's because of the manifestations of the ego in, that, in the subconscious. We can think of our mind like a city. Just think of your mind like a big city. And just like a city has nice, fancy, upscale areas and bad, degenerated areas where crime and poverty exist, so does our mind have good areas and bad areas. Okay, and that's the thing to remember. We all like to think we're perfect. I mean, I don't know about you people. I know I'm all right, but you people might have problems, but, but not me. This is all I'm talking about you here, right? We tend to do that all the time. We don't want to acknowledge our dark side. But remember the expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's because of this, that expression is true. 
Okay, and I used the, the, the horrible example before of uh, talking about Adolf Hitler. In the end, he was, he was trying to create a utopia for his people. He was trying to do something very good, and in the process of doing that, became one of the most uh, atrocious human beings humanity's ever encountered. Um, we have to all remember that there's egos that we have that you could kind of call good. Egos that, you know, want to help people and do charitable things and that kind of stuff. We also have to remember that everything is in balance, so we also carry within us egos that aren't so good. So just like every city has the good parts and the bad parts, our own psychology has good areas and bad areas. Our actions and things that we'll sometimes do will be for compassion and the benefit of other people. But then again, sometimes they'll be selfish and uh, self-interest and all that kind of stuff. So we have to acknowledge that we're not perfect. All of humanity is not perfect. Okay, every human walking on this planet right now is not perfect. We all have our strengths and weaknesses. The problem is we're usually not fully aware of our strengths and weaknesses. And we're usually under the assumption that everybody else has got something wrong with them, but we're kind of okay. And that's that idealized self-imaging. And this is a, an expression that goes along with that. There is much virtue in the wicked and much wickedness in the virtuous, which is also expressed in the concept of the yin and yang, right? There's a little bit of good in everything that's dark, and there's a little bit of darkness in everything that's good. That's really what we're talking about here. It's, it's the same kind of concept. There's much virtue in the wicked and much wickedness, or sorry, wickedness in the virtuous. It's that same kind of a concept. Just like every city has a nice part and a bad part, our psychology is like that as well. We tend to usually play up the really good parts and want to ignore and forget the bad parts, just like any city does in their politics, right? Same kind of idea. We do it with our own psychology. Now, just like if you were driving through a city, you're kind of aware of where we are at any given time. So usually if you're driving through a city, you know where you live, you know where you work, you know where you're traveling. We should be aware of what parts of our psychological city we're in at any given time. If we have an action, or a thought, or an emotion, or an impulse, what I mean by this statement is where did it come from? Did it come from that nice, good, upscale area of the city, aka the consciousness, the will of the higher self? Or did it come from that bad, seedy kind of the city, which would represent hidden egos in our psychological depths? Okay, so that's the claim we have to ask ourselves. Just like right now you go, okay, we're in South London. It's a pretty nice neighborhood. It's a fairly safe place to be in London. You know, we feel comfortable in this area of the city. When we have a, an action or a thought or something like that, we have to be aware of where is that coming from? Where did, at what point of our psychological city did that thought originate? Okay, is it basically coming from our consciousness or is it coming from the ego? And if it's coming from the ego, which ones? Is it coming from the egos that we're kind of aware of? Or is it coming from an even deeper level, a more hidden level of our psychology? The hidden side of ourselves is important because this is where we find the origin of our errors. A lot of the things that we do, a lot of the thoughts, actions, and ways that the various egos manifest, we find the origin of that in the hidden side of ourselves. And that's why it's such a, a tricky thing to, to really think about. We have this area of our psychology that we can't see, just like there's an area of, our, of the moon that we can't see, but a lot of the things that we do, the impulses for our behavior, come from that hidden aspect. And this is something that psychologists know. That's why if you go to see a psychologist, they will ask you questions about your childhood, questions about dreams and thoughts and that kind of stuff, because they know that if they get to you know, start poking around inside the subconscious mind, they can often find the root of things like depression or insomnia or, you know, various anxieties and, and, and things like that. The root of a lot of our behavior, which includes our intellectual state, our emotional state, and sometimes physical manifestations, can be found in the subconscious. We know that there are some ailments of the physical body, especially gastrointestinal things, that can be related to various thoughts and that kind of stuff. Okay, people that have sometimes, you know, fears and phobias that can manifest as various physical ailments as well. If you're in the wrong state of mind emotionally and mentally, you can literally make yourself sick. We've all heard of that before. Just think of, uh, you know, when you're really nervous, that has profound changes in your body. Your heart rate goes up, you start sweating profusely. There's all kinds of uh, chemicals that are dumped in your bloodstream like adrenaline and that kind of stuff. 
So everything from our physical health to our thoughts to our emotions can be affected by what's happening in the hidden side of our psychology. Problem is, we have no idea what's going on in there. We have no idea what's actually happening in those hidden hotel rooms that we can't really see. We have no idea what the motives and the impulses are. <clears throat> Consequently, these become the hidden side of ourself becomes some of the reasons why we incorrectly relate not only to ourselves but also with our fellow man. We find a lot of conflict in the various relationships we have from society as a whole or humanity as a whole, but also interpersonal relationships like you know, sitting with others, friends and family and co-workers. Some of the reasons why we incorrectly relate to people are found in that hidden aspect of our psychology. We don't even correctly relate to ourselves and fully understand ourselves. How are we then supposed to be able to fully understand other people? If we really have no idea what's going on in our psychology, how are we supposed to understand what's going on in other people's psychology? If we have a totally distorted perspective of who we are, how are we supposed to know who anybody else is? But the problem is we don't do that. We just make all these assumptions and go through life making these assumptions, acting and reacting to the various situations that we find ourselves in. So let's have a look at that concept of the idealized self-image. We have created a portrait of ourselves, a perfect idealized image. We put ourselves on a pedestal and usually don't acknowledge our defects. If we do acknowledge our defects, it's usually to rationalize them. Well, I know I did that, but, you know, I know I got angry, but you did this, or you did that, or this happened, or somebody cut me off in a car, or some circumstance happened that basically means that I have to get angry. Okay, so if we do encounter uh, even people that do things like, you know, drink too much alcohol or, or smoke, I have a, a close friend that, uh, that uh, is trying to kick smoking as a, as a habit and um, had quit for a very long time and I, I you know, caught them smoking again. I'm like, uh, I thought you quit. Yeah, well, my grandfather passed away. I'm like, okay, I understand that's a difficult thing to do, but once again, that's something that you, you've rationalized a part of you. You had no choice but to do this action because of X. So your smoking was simply a reaction, and I had no choice. It was totally out of my hands. So, you know, we tend to do that from one side of our lives to the other. We do that all the time, like continually, at many points during the day. We put ourselves on that pedestal. We don't acknowledge our defects. We will easily excuse behavior in ourselves that we wouldn't tolerate for a minute in other people. We easily pass away all kinds of things that we do and rationalize, and it was okay because, we, but we won't tolerate that for a minute from a friend, family, or co-workers. We are all hypocritical and have a tendency to hide our own defects. That's the other thing that we do. We've created this almost sense of camouflage, and we hide a lot of our defects. So not only do we not, are we not even aware of them in the first place, we have a real tendency to not want to be aware of them to keep them covered up, almost as a weird state of self-preservation or some sort of weird self-defense mechanism, we tend to help cover up our own defects. It's almost like the egos help hide each other, okay, by covering each other up. These are some of the things that really make it hard to get a sense of, of who we really are, the whole concept of nositate ipsum. When the light of the consciousness illuminates our hidden side, we reduce the false image of ourselves to dust and discover our true selves, discover who we really are. And that's a big aspect of these studies. Okay, we have to be prepared to take down that false image. Because if we're not correctly um, perceiving ourselves, then we can't correctly perceive the world around us. This is a difficult thing to do, and not a lot of people are prepared to do that. To really walk this path, you have to hold up a mirror and be prepared to really accept the reflection that comes back. A lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people would prefer to hide all that stuff. It's just easier to think that, you know, everything we do is perfect and continue rationalizing. And we can do that basically indefinitely, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. But it takes a certain amount of strength, a certain amount of willpower to say, you know what? You know, I'm not perfect. Okay, and that goes back to the biblical concept of, you know, he without sin be the one to cast the first stone, right? That whole concept of, of Jesus at the, at the stoning. And that, there's a lot of uh, uh, 
messages there that pertain to what we're talking about right here. We all perceive ourselves to be perfect. It's other people that are the problem. It's other people that need to be judged and condemned and put in the right place and sorted out and all these different words. We very rarely want to do that ourselves. But when we really walk this path to the awakening of a consciousness, we have to be prepared to do that, to really closely examine our own psychology, to look at ourselves honestly, without judgment, and work towards changing who we are. Now this is a, a, a difficult aspect of, of the study of, of our own psychology, and this is something personally that I, I had a, a hard time accepting, and it took me a little while to really understand this, and I had to do a lot of self-observation and reflection to really understand this concept, because it's something that most people generally kind of react a bit to, because once again, to understand this is to understand that we're not perfect. <coughs> We project the unknown, unconscious side of ourselves onto other people and then see it in them. Okay, because we all carry the same egos. So we project that unknown, unconscious side of ourselves onto other people and then see that hidden side of ourselves manifesting in others. A way that really helps to understand this statement is this one here. That which we so much criticize in others is the same thing which lies in the hidden side of ourselves that we neither know nor want to recognize. We're all humans. We all have the same defects. So next time somebody does something, rather than going, you know, what, what, were, they who were, they, what, what were they thinking? Like, what were they getting off saying that? Rather than criticizing other people, next time we see something in somebody that bothers us, instead of criticizing, condemning, and judging them, why don't we look inside ourselves to see if we've ever done that behavior, if we've ever manifested that particular action or emotion or what it is they're doing. Okay? Rather than you, me, you, know, you getting angry and me judging, going, I don't know what your problem is, like, what are you flying off the handle for? Like, yeah, what you, what's your problem? Rather than doing that, wouldn't it be better for me to go, wow, he's really angry. Have I ever been really angry? I was angry the other day. Yeah, anger's a really tough ego. It makes you do all kinds of, you know, blah, blah, blah. We see others as we really are. The defects we criticize in others also exist in ourselves. Hence, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone. That's that whole story that Jesus was trying to tell us. They were condemning and criticizing the behavior of somebody else, but everybody there was also an imperfect being. Everybody there was also carrying all kinds of defects and probably guilty of some of the same behavior that they were trying to stone somebody for. Okay, so when we really look at that simple story of he was about sin cast the first stone, we're really expanding on that and we're talking about the exact same concept. There's so many things that we see and react to in other people, but we're all humans, we all carry the same egos. They just manifest in different levels, in different ways, in different degrees, but we all carry the same. Next time you see somebody getting carried away and angry, what, you've, you've never got angry before? There's nothing in life that ever makes you angry, that ever makes you manifest anger? You never lost your temper? Would it then be not more of a, a, a beneficial thing instead of judging and condemning that person because you truly don't know what circumstances they're in and what you know, pressures and you know, life challenges they're under? Would it then not make more sense, instead of judging and condemning them, to really analyze ourselves, to really have a look at our own psychology? That's exactly what we're talking about. We think we're perfect and we become offended if anyone suggests otherwise. If I wanted to really get you upset right now, I could simply insult you. But really, what is an insult? An insult is something that does not match your image of yourself. Okay, because if I said, well, you know, well, you know, you got a real temper and you're flying off the handle all the time. If you were really honest, you'd say, yeah, there's times that I, yeah, you're right, there's times that I get angry. Hmm. Instead of, who the hell do you think you are telling me I get angry? What's your problem? But the typical human behavior is when we get any kind of information that doesn't match our idealized self-image, in an attempt to preserve that image, we have this weird self-defense mechanism where we immediately spring forth to defend that image. 
And that's one of the ways that we find a, a lot of tension and conflict existing amongst humanity as a, as a whole race, but also ourselves individually. We like to think we're perfect and we'll defend that idealized self-image to, to the, in some cases, to the death, becoming offended if anything or anyone suggests something other than what our model of our psychology is. Okay, there's all kinds of different negative ways to react to that. People can react with anger. Sometimes people can react with, with depression and low self-esteem. There's all kinds of different psychological and social problems that result because of this whole statement. So if we think we're honest, if someone suggests something other than that, something that doesn't match our portrait, that creates a reaction. Okay, rather than saying, oh, they said that I'm not honest. Oh boy, I wonder, I wonder how I manifested that. I wonder what was the circumstances. I didn't even, I didn't even see that ego. Let me think about what happened again. Rather than internalizing that to discover the source of that, we immediately react. It's not me, it's you. Right? I'm fine. If you tell me that I'm honest, what's your problem? Who the hell do you think you are? What do you get off judging me? And, you know, that whole train of thought. It doesn't have to be verbally expressed. There's lots of different ways that we can express that situation. We can internalize it, you know, be angry and um, inside, not to physically, you know, be violent and hit people and that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, somebody says something that we don't agree with, there's going to be a reaction. That reaction is going to then manifest and sustain various egos as we dwell on it, think about it, brood on it, or whatever it is we do, however it is that we handle the manifestation of that particular ego. That which condemns and criticizes others is our own errors. In the end, what is it that's judging and criticizing the fellow man? The egos you carry within. So you're using the non-perfect side of yourself, the non-divine side of yourself, to judge and condemn other people for not being perfect. That doesn't even make any sense, yet we do it all the time. What is it that's judging and condemning and criticizing other people? The errors that we carry within. Because in the end, the consciousness, the divine spark, the soul, that doesn't condemn, that doesn't criticize, that doesn't judge. Okay, think of all the great masters. Think of someone like Jesus and Buddha. These, they weren't condemning, they weren't criticizing, they weren't judging. They were accepting. They were trying to, to help humanity. Okay, that which condemns and criticizes behaviors and emotions and words and actions of others is the errors that we carry within ourselves. Okay, the egos that we carry within our own defects. That's what's judging and criticizing other people. And if you really reflect on that for a while, it seems almost absurd or silly, but that's what we all do. It's <coughs> the, you know, the egos in me that are reacting, judging, and criticizing the egos in you. Yes? I'm not quite sure I understand. If we condemn yeah. someone who's a murderer, for example, uh -huh. that doesn't mean that we're, uh, it means we have the potential for murdering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a, as a But it doesn't mean race. we're murderers. No. Right? No. So condemning something that's immoral or, or inappropriate behavior mm -hmm. is not necessarily a, a projection of something that you've done or feel. Uh, yeah, not, not necessarily all the time, no. I mean, if we're talking about things like murder and stuff like that, that's like a far extreme as well in the spectrum. Yeah. But moral issues. See, but moral issues can get... Moral issues, moral issues can get dicey because many times what is it defines morality? It's the zeitgeist of the times, right? So it's the, the, the culture and the time period of the place that can define something as moral or not. So how would you, I mean, it's got to be a thin line, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you define when you're projecting and when you're, you're truly saying this is inappropriate behavior on your part? That's where the whole concept of self-observation comes in. That's where we have to separate, if we've got that, that thought of the impulse, that's where we have to separate what's coming from the ego and what's coming from the consciousness. Because in the end, if you're looking for that moral compass, let's just say, that moral compass isn't going to come from the ego. That true moral compass is, is the consciousness, is the higher self. And that's why part of the studies is really spending a lot of time with self-observation to learn to separate the difference between those two voices. What is the, the, the will of the higher self? When is it the consciousness is speaking? And when is it the ego that's condemning, judging, and that kind of thing? So that's, and it, that's why we're keep, you're gonna be so sick of me talking about self-observation. You're going to get tired of asking questions and you go, oh, self-observation, self-observation. But that's why we spend so much time talking about that. 
is because we have questions like that, well, what is the right course of action? What am I supposed to do here? You know, how are you supposed to judge? And the answer to all of that is, is really working towards eliminating the ego and developing that consciousness. Because in the end, it's the consciousness that's going to then be able to manifest. And it's the consciousness that we then can use for guidance. And it's the consciousness we can use for the moral compass and use to steer the ship of our life. It kind um, of seems like you're saying that before you lash out at somebody else, you may see something that you find unacceptable that they're doing, but instead of opening your mouth, <coughs> stop for a second and question why you find that objectionable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and think it to yourself, is, is there any time I've manifested this behavior? Obviously, you can take that and go to extremes, like you can start talking about murder and all kinds of stuff like that. No, just because you're reacting to that, and somebody doesn't mean that you do that to yourself. Um, but if you look at some, sometimes, even if you look at something like murder, that, that can oftentimes stem from something like anger. And I'm not saying, well, that we all have the potential to be murderers, but we all have the potential to lose our temper. Some people take that to a ridiculous extreme of harming other, harming other people, but the root of that behavior was the anger. Okay, think of a crime of passion between a you know, husband and wife. The root of that crime could have been something like jealousy. That's something we all have the ability to carry within, right? The whole concept of, you know, we who is like sin cast the first stone, that kind of idea that... We're not saying it's okay for, for people to do things like that, but we all carry the same egos. We all carry those same things within. And it would be more of a, a use to ourselves to really look inside our own psychology than it is to condemn and judge others. Um, a famous thing, or not a famous thing right now, everybody's talking about money and finances and people getting raises, especially among public workers and that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're not on the receiving end of that raise, you're judging and criticizing, condemning. If you're the one getting on that raise, you'd be justifying and saying why it was required and that kind of stuff. You tend to do things like that all the time. If it's not happening to you, then this is a problem because and people shouldn't get paid this much and that kind of thing. But when it's happening to you, you have a perfectly good reason why you should be. Everybody thinks they should earn more money, but nobody thinks anybody else should be paid any more than what they're getting right now. Uh, it's a really interesting concept, and I was reading this uh, 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 psychological paper on how that behavior manifests even to the point of people that are earning salaries of hundreds of millions of dollars. How they can still look at their own work and say, I am not getting paid enough. Just like everybody here, no matter what you're doing, thinks, I, I, I deserve more, I'm a hard worker, I'm honest, I, do, I, did, I deserve more. That attitude keeps going whether you're earning 25000 a year, 100000 a year, or $3 million a year. You keep thinking that you're not paid enough. You keep looking at other people and going, well, if I'm getting X and they're getting Y and I'm doing way more than them and have way more responsibility, therefore I'm, I should be paid a lot more than them. And that's why we see everything in society just going out of control, especially when you look at something like um, having access to government money where there's, you know, no, seems no real shortage of that lately. But uh, the newspapers are full of that, right? People judging public servants and unions and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, my reaction is the same thing. Like, there's no money, we've got this huge de deficit. We can't afford to pay more people, but, geez, I hope I get a really good bonus at Christmas this year because I've, <laughs> I've been working real hard and doing all kinds of stuff, right? That's just kind of a, as an example of where we see that happening, not only on an individual scale, but also at the level of a, a whole society or a whole culture as well. Uh, when we condemn, this is a couple of examples just to, just to think about, reflect on. When we condemn or criticizing others for losing their temper, so what? We've never been angry before? We've never manifested that anger? When we condemn other people or criticize other people or confront other people for lying, what? We, we've never altered the truth in any way whatsoever? When we talk about people being full of themselves, oh, that person's got a, such an ego, they're always talking them high about themselves, they're always full of themselves. What, we've never been proud of anything we've done? We've never been excited about an accomplishment and wanted to share it with other people? Remember, uh, this is something else, what was I reading the other day? Um, when you're driving in the 401, anyone that's driving faster than you is a maniac, anyone that's driving slower than you is an idiot, right? <laughs> That's the, that's the way we always look at it. Somebody's driving fast, what if a maniac is crazy? Somebody drives, what's the problem with this idiot that won't get out of the road? That's just what we do, right? We look at ourselves as the perfect scale and use that to measure everything else. The problem being is we are not perfect. That is not the scale to hold the rest of humanity towards. And there's another example of that right there. So, you know, when something good happens to us, we want to tell everyone that we know we're really happy about our accomplishments. But when somebody else does that to us, it's like, will you just shut up already? Yeah, we've heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all know what you did. Oh, you're so special. 
Um, driving errors, that's the worst kind. Driving erratically. We've never made any driving errors. <coughs> you know, we talk about people, you know, going through the red light or cutting us off. So what, we've never been distracted for a second and did something silly on the road? Of course not. We may have, but we had a perfectly good reason for doing it at the time. I'm like, oh, those are the crazy people going around everywhere. Uh, drinking in excess. Sometimes we can criticize people for drinking too much and, you know, imbibing in, in alcohol and libations. And we've never been in that scenario. We've never been in this situation. Yeah, some people haven't, but uh, most of you, maybe at some point, at some time, has, you know, had one drink too many. Uh, you could keep doing this list all day, right? That's the general idea. Instead of, you know, looking at all these things and other people, using other people as a mirror in which to measure ourselves. Okay, not necessarily like we used to state it and uh, talk about the extreme murdering somebody, not saying because we react to a murderer, therefore we're a murderer ourselves, but when we see actions in other people, use that almost like a lens in which to measure ourselves and say, well, how is it that I've ever done this? Because you know that person that drives you nuts at work, or that person or that friend or that coworker, that person that just annoys you, perhaps or the person you live with, <laughs> or the person you live with, yeah, the person that annoys you, the person that drives you crazy the most. <clears throat> Don't forget that you are somebody else's, right? And that's an important thing to remember. We all have somebody in our life that just kind of rubs us the wrong way. It could be a neighbor, it could be a coworker, it could be the friend of a friend, it could be a, someone married to a family member, it could be somebody in our own family. There's someone that just drives us crazy. We always have to remember that we are that for somebody else. So instead of judging that person all the time or criticizing that person, using them to discover things within ourselves. And that's a, a story I don't know if I mentioned before, um, a famous story of Master Samael. In his town, there was this person that everybody disliked. He was kind of a really loudmouth, annoying person. Every day, he'd go and have coffee with him. Every morning, he'd get up and go see this guy and you know, spend some time talking to him. And people used to say, how can you stand that guy? And he used to say, it's perfect. All this time I spend with him, you wouldn't believe what I've learned about myself. Just using that man's manifestations to find things within himself as he reacted to all these various behaviors of this other gentleman, we could then use that as a, as a mirror to look inside his own psychology. It's like we can't look inside our own psychology directly, but we can use other people like mirrors to see what we are. That's basically what we're talking about with this. I, I have a story that uh, speaks to that as well. Sure. It's uh, the story of, um, excuse me for my voice, uh, it's the story of a psych, uh, psychologist or a psychiatrist who's working in a um, psychiatric ward of a hospital. And he had a hundred um, patients, and um, within six months, uh, the psychiatric ward had to be closed because the hundred patients he had were all cured. And so they asked um, the psychologist, the psychiatrist, um, "How on earth did you cure everyone in such a short period of time?" And he said, "I dealt." With each patient, the issues of the, each patient, uh, I, I sought to see what that patient was reflecting in myself. I healed, I healed what that patient was reflecting back to me in myself, and immediately healed them. And he did that for each one, and each one was healed and cured. Well, hey, it's like Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world, right? So that speaks um, to what you're saying. It, and very powerfully to the in, to the point that um, uh, N to pen, the alchemical formula, all is one. Mm -hmm. So in fact, um, as we perceive ourselves to be separate entities, in fact, this is all a grand illusion. For we're we are all, all one. We're all the sons and daughters of the Creator of God. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I like that. <coughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <coughs> And in the end, yeah, all this behavior that we exhibit is the same that everybody else exhibits. We all carry the same egos. We're all imperfect beings. I like that story. That's good. Uh, when we know the hidden side of ourselves, when we know our own errors, we then see our fellow man correctly without projecting our own defects onto them. Okay, when we really get to know who we are, when we're able to know that hidden side of ourselves, then we're actually able to see our fellow man correctly. We're not able, or we're in a state of consciousness where we no longer react to other people. Remember, a large portion of our life is spent reacting to other people. 
and other people bring out all kinds of types of, of thoughts and emotions and manifestations of various sorts within ourselves. When we're able to correctly relate to ourselves, then we're able to correctly relate to other people. When we're basically able to uh, illuminate the hidden side of our psychology, when we see ourselves in the correct light, then we see other people in the correct light, which once again goes to the story you were just talking about, working with yourself and then seeing changes manifesting in other people. So for example, if I have really studied anger, if I have worked towards eliminating the ego of anger within myself, if I have observed, comprehended, and eliminated anger within myself, if I'm aware of its existence, if I know how, it, how it's caused, if I understand the effects it has, then I will understand the manifestation of anger when I see it in others. If I truly comprehend anger within myself, I no longer react to anger in you. Okay, because normally we see people getting angry. There's a reaction there. You know, who does that person think they are? How dare you say that to me? We have a reaction, and then they react, and we react, and situations escalate. This is one of the things that allows us to basically not identify with somebody else's manifestations of ego. If we truly comprehend an ego, we no longer react to that manifestation of ego in other people. I've told you this story before, probably of Buddha meditating under the tree, Buddha sitting there meditating, somebody walks by and starts insulting him, they confront him, you look like an idiot sitting there under that tree, why don't you, you know, get a real job, sit around meditating all day. Buddha simply stopped meditating, opened his eyes, looked at the individual and said, my brother, what do you do when somebody gives you a gift that you don't want? And the guy that's insulting Buddha says, well, you just tell him to take it back. And then Buddha says, well, please take your gift and leave, and goes right back into meditation. Okay? He didn't see the need to react to the insults or things that were being said to him because he comprehended his own psychology. Okay? He chose, or he made a decision or, or made a choice not to accept or identify with the emotions and things that were being directed at him. Okay? Just like they teach you in martial arts, if you, if you really get in depth to the psychology of martial arts, you never attack anybody. You just choose to not receive their kicks and punches and return them to them. You're just returning their energy back to them. It's the same kind of a, a thought here. Once we truly and comprehend a particular ego, we then accept and tolerate this behavior in other people without reacting to it. Okay, so that's why somebody like a, a Jesus or Buddha can could, could be surrounded by all these different types of, you know, egos and that kind of stuff. This is how somebody like Jesus could be, you know, condemned to death without really protesting or saying anything during the whole proceeding. Okay, and simply not reacting to the manifestations of, of ego in other people because we truly understand them within ourselves. Okay, when somebody gets angry, if we truly understand anger, we can almost take almost a, like a quasi-sympathetic view of, well, I've been there, I've been angry too. Anger's a tough one. Anger really, you know, gets you going and it makes you say stupid things, makes you do bad things, it makes you lash out at people like you're doing to me right now, but hey, it's just an emotion, you know, it'll pass. And then I'll come back and talk to you when the emotion's passed and we can, you know, go on to solve the problem rather than reacting and becoming offended and lashing out in turn and all that kind of stuff. And this is an important concept because, here's a quote, one must receive with gladness the unpleasant manifestations of others. This is a quote from Master Samael, but all the world's religions have various forms of this quote. Uh, the famous uh, biblical one is, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or if your neighbor you know, smites you on one cheek, turn and, off, turn and offer him the other. It's basically the same kind of concept. The idea that how do we you know, love our fellow man unconditionally when people do all kinds of horrible things? Okay, how is that supposed to turn the other cheek or do unto others? How is it even supposed to, to do that? Because, you know, if somebody's doing something horrible to me, then I'm going to do something horrible back. That seems to be the general consensus of society. But instead, we have to learn to receive with gladness the unpleasant manifestations of others, which is the same thing as turn the other cheek, which is the same thing as do unto others. We have to learn to be passive, not reactive. Now, I really have to define how I'm using passive here. By passive, I don't mean a doorstop. I don't mean lie down and you know, take it and let people walk all over you. I'm talking about the way we react and using our psychology. I'm talking about a passive psychology as opposed to reactive psychology. Remember that a reactive psychology, a reaction, is a manifestation of an ego. To be passive is to use the consciousness, to stay in the here and now, in the present moment, 
with awareness. Okay, where we're not simply reacting, but we're not responding to the other person. Okay, which means we're not allowing the other person to push our buttons and control us. It doesn't have to be a person, it could be a situation. Our car won't start, our computer crashes. Okay, be passive to the circumstances of life, not reactive. To be passive is to work with the consciousness, to stay in the present moment. To be reactive is to respond with an ego to get sad, to get angry, to get frustrated, to get nervous, to get anxious, to be afraid. Those are reactions. Okay? In order to receive with gladness, turn the other cheek, we have to learn how to activate that aspect of our psychology. When we are reactive, that means we're identifying with the egos. If you say something which offends me and I react with anger, I've identified with an ego. I've allowed that ego to manifest and then perhaps it's making me say things, making me do things, whatever. When we react to something, when we identify with an ego, we feed and we strengthen that ego. Yes? Okay. Sometimes we can like handle a situation uh, uh, alive, like you said last, last week. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, when you are training, uh -huh. you, you have all of these just by dancing because it's free to feel whatever it's actually. Yes. How, can, how, how can like uh, go over this uh, situation? I mean, I can, if I can do it, uh, if I can tolerate something from someone, mm -hmm. but I, I don't want to keep it because if I'm dreaming about the same thing during the night or uh, with this uh, ego mm -hmm. playing up during the night, that mean that, I mean, how is the way or the step to, to go over this? You're not going to like the answer, self-observation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really is learning to understand the reactions in ourselves. Before, look, it's not a case of, uh, you know, having a situation where something, somebody does something to us that bothers us. It's not a case of, well, you know, how do I accept that person or how do I accept that behavior? It's a case of changing yourself. And you can't you know, change anything in your dreams without changing anything in your waking life. So let's say somebody did something to me or is doing something to me and it bothers me and it's, it's, it's you know, perhaps making me angry or, or it's, it's causing me problems and it's constantly on my mind and I'm thinking about it at night. It's not how do we accept it or how do we deal with them, it's how do we deal with ourselves. Okay, we look at why am I reacting to that situation. If somebody's being angry or, you know, and, that, and their anger is making me upset, it's not how do I deal with them or how do I accept them, it's what do I know about anger within myself? How have I ever manifested this? How, how they're making me feel, at some point I've made somebody else feel. What is it within me that causes me to react to this? Then the question is how can I comprehend the ego? I mean, I know at the beginning you say, you just see what I'm feeling. How can I react? Or, mm -hmm. And then that is just the identification. Yeah? Yes. And then the next, the next step is just to com comprehend the ego. And yeah. then how is the process to... Well, comprehension, we have to... We say, okay, the first step is identifying. Yeah. It's saying, okay, anger. Oh, I'm feeling angry right now. Mm -hmm. The comprehension is the questioning process. Why am I feeling angry? Exactly what is it? That, uh, let's, say you, let's say you insult me. And I feel like, you know, you say something about my shirt. Mm -hmm. and I feel that, or maybe that a bit of embarrassment of, oh no, they don't like my shirt. And I'm like, how the hell is she to judge what I'm wearing? Where did that come from? Why am I reacting to somebody else? Why, is, what is it about my shirt that's upsetting me? Well, I like to think that I'm, you know, I'm a snappy dresser. I'm, you know, perfect. It goes once again to that concept of a pedestal. I think I'm perfect. You insult my shirt, that's telling me that you think that I did something bad. And that means that I'm not perfect, so now I'm angry because you're trying to tell me I'm not perfect. It's getting to the root of our psychology, and it begins by asking questions. Questioning yourself, why am I feeling, I'm feeling angry, that's the identification, but why? Because that person doesn't like my shirt? Because that other driver cut me off? So what? Maybe they got a call from the hospital. Maybe their wife's giving birth. Maybe I should pull over and let them pass. I, I don't know. Why is it always we, we, we assume the worst of people? 
It's just questioning that whole process, and, and doing that allows you to arrive at revelations about yourself. And that's the problem. I can't tell you all that stuff. You have to discover that for yourself. Remember my silly story of standing in Walmart and watching the old lady pay with the change? My reaction is, oh, I'm going to be late for a camp. Will it? Why? Why am I doing this? Because who am I? So I'm going to be two minutes late for work. So what? That, you know, I should be looking at her with compassion. She's paying a change because maybe that's all she has. And I have the luxury to, you know, pay with lots of bills in my pocket. Why am I reacting? Why am I identifying with that negative emotion? Look at all these people in the line. Everybody's, you know, directing all this negative energy at that poor woman. That's karmic. That's negative energy that you're directing out in the universe. It's going to come back to you at some point. It's just questioning that psychology, and it's you have to arrive at your own conclusions. And for me, that day with the, with the lady at Walmart, it was I reacted like that because I think I'm better than her because I think I'm more important because she is making me late and I have places to go because I am very important. And then you realize, who am I? Who am I? And I'm a grain of sand on a, on a beach. You know, I'm a drop from a big ocean. I'm just like everybody else. I'm no more important than she is. And for all I know, she's going to go on to do something more important and significant to the whole of humanity than maybe I ever will. Okay, how do you know you're not more important than the ant you just stepped on in the greatest scheme of things? We don't. We just all like to think that we do. Okay, and part of the process of, of comprehension is asking yourself those questions. If it's something that's bothering you, why? Why is it you? Why are you dreaming about it? Why are you thinking about it all day? Why is it upsetting you or making you tense or making you angry or making you afraid? Why? What is at the root of that? And it's just, whenever you're questioning, whenever you're going why and what's happening, then you split yourself into the observer and the observed. And when you split yourself into the observer and the observed, you're staying in that present moment by going, why is this happening? Specifically, what is it that's upsetting me? That's staying in the present moment. That's not giving in to that anger or that fear or the jealousy or the frustration and letting it take you somewhere else, but you're standing firmly in one spot and saying, what's going on here? Why? Not simply letting the ego take you for a ride, but staying firmly planted in the present moment and questioning all that sort of stuff. That's comprehension. Yes. Uh, this week I read that the uh, the root cause of all of this mm -hmm. um, can be traced back to one one thing, and it's the weapon of choice of the ego, and that is uh, guilt. Mm -hmm. And that all stems from guilt. And mm -hmm. by dissolving guilt in oneself and in their unworthiness and restoring our divinity, then we destroy the illusion that is the ego. And it notices we look at that, we look at fear, guilt, and anger as like the big three that all kind of come down to, to causing all the problems, same kind of concept. I think the expression is fear, guilt, anger, whoever liberate, liberates himself from these emotions will dominate the world. Apparently, uh, fear and anger are byproducts of guilt. Um, Interesting. It, uh, anger is used as an attack mechanism yeah. as a result of feelings of unworth in the self. Which would go along with the idea of not uh, not the concept of this, these the golden image. If we get something that suggests that we're not in that, we react with that defense mechanism. Yeah, and so we have, and so and fear stems from again guilt. So if, if there is no guilt, if one feels innocent, uh, pure, holy, and good, then there can be no fear, and there can be no anger, and all power uh, lies with the person who's eliminated the guilt within. Interesting. And that's what I read this week in uh, A Course in Miracles, supposedly dictated uh, by Jesus to um, somebody in the 70s. It's called The Course in Miracles. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I think we have a class at some point coming up called Difficult <coughs> Egos. And you look at some of those <coughs> because when you do, and that's why you've, you've got to do this for yourself, when you do self-observation, when you start getting to the roots, you start discovering you come back to an awful lot of the same roots over and over again. Like that, when I talked about, for me personally, uh, coming back to the idea of, you know, I'm way more important than everyone else, there's a lot of situations I found myself in where I really started peeling back the layers of that onion and going, oh, there it is again, me thinking that I'm better than everybody else. That was responsible for that anger, that frustration, or that pride, or whatever. And that's, yeah, getting down to, to the real roots of things. And the further you go into psychology, <laughs> the more you get down until you get to a single point, which is the origin of all egos, and that's the one that you really want to get rid of. Um, so yeah, uh, reactive is identifying with the egos, 
And how is it that we can tolerate the unpleasant actions of others if we do not know our own unpleasant manifestations? Okay, how can I turn the other cheek when someone's being angry to me if I don't truly understand the manifestation of anger within myself? When I truly understand the manifestation within myself, then I can not react to that behavior in other people. Doesn't mean I have to, you know, roll over and take it and get stomped on, but it means I don't have to identify with it. I don't have to react to it. And any time that we're not reacting, we always have a fork in the road available to us. The ego wants to take us left, and if we react, we always go left. But if we can remain in the present moment, if we can work with that consciousness, that divine spark, there's a fork in the road. The ego wants to take us left, but now we have another route, the route of the consciousness, which is right, okay, as opposed to the left side. Remember that the egos are dissolved through rigorous comprehension, which is why you're going to get sick of saying it, self-observation, 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 self-observation. Companion to say that dozens of times each class. That's why we spent so much time talking about that technique. That's why it pretty much cropped up in every class and why a lot of the questions and answers are self-observation. Because it goes back to remember that phrase that hung above all the temples in the Greeks, Nasate Ipsum, know thyself. I can't tell you about yourself. Nobody can tell you about yourself. You can't read a book about yourself. You have to write that book yourself by working with self-observation, okay? Through rigorous comprehension, through questioning. Remember that we have, because of our whole lives, we've been building patterns of behavior. We're mechanical, we're creatures of habit. We have patterns in the chairs that we like to sit in, in rooms, but we also have patterns in our emotions and in our thoughts and various aspects of our psychology. We have to question those patterns and ask why. Why do I always, somebody insults me, I get angry, why? Or somebody insults me, you may not get angry, you may become self-conscious. Or somebody insults me, or you may become embarrassed. Like, we all have our own reactions, but why do we have them? Because they've been there for a long time, and it doesn't necessarily mean that because we've always done that, it's right or correct. To comprehend truly, we have to analyze all our subconscious motives, the actions and reaction of the ego, both externally and internally. Find the hidden impulses and causes. This is how we comprehend the ego in all levels of the mind. And I'm using the analogy, the mind is like an onion. Imagine an onion with 49 skins you could peel off. Sometimes you, you think it's one way, you know, you're in the lineup at Walmart and you react with anger. Okay, why? Peel off a layer of the onion. Well, because I'm being, you know, late for work, because I have places to go, because... And then you just keep peeling back the layers until you get to the root cause of some of your behaviors. Same thing with, with, with things like fear or whatever particular challenges that you have in your life. You have to keep peeling everything back until you get to the root. And that's when you're going to start to see changes in your psychology. Remember, it's not good enough to go, yeah, I know I'm angry right now. This person's holding me up in the line. Yeah, I know I'm angry. I probably shouldn't be. No, why? Why are you angry in the first place? What is it that reacted in you? Where does that reaction come from? Why is the anger generated? You've got to ask yourself those questions. Uh, examples of some hidden impulses, uh, envy. Envy is a strange one. That's the source of the fuel which drives our materialistic society. We all want more stuff. Why? Because I have to have better stuff than you. Why? Because I'm better than you. Because my golden idol of myself says I am. And if I'm better than you, I have to have more things, uh, make more money, have a nicer car, have a more attractive partner, have better children, have a better lawn. And it goes and goes and goes, right? The whole concept of keeping up with the Joneses. The result of that is us trying to measure ourselves against other people. Okay, we have that idealized self-image, and I'm better than you, and you better not do anything that suggests you're better than me, because I didn't agree with my model, because now I'm going to have to do something to correct that. So you got a better car? Oh, you got a better car than me. Damn, I'm going to have to get a new car now. Because I can't have you having a better car than me, because that might mean you're not, you know, you're not, or I'm not better than you. And we do silly things like that at a subconscious level. And it, here's, it's kind of, you know, funny that to the stories I'm telling, it's kind of almost comical to listen to them, but that's what we do. That's what a lot of society does. People working so much overtime that they neglect their families and their children and cause marital problems to get what? More stuff more cars, more hobby things, more stuff in our house, none of it we can take with us when we go, and it's all a big illusion and distraction. So envy is a really strange one to study. Self-importance. Self-importance you can often trace back to anger, impatience, pride, frustration, jealousy, all that kind of stuff. 
Okay, so these are examples of impulses that aren't visible straight away. You know, we, we, we see somebody, our neighbor pulls in with a, a nice new car, we feel that jealousy or that frustration or that displeasure. Why? Where does that come from? And these are really interesting ones because these are some of the ones you keep coming back to. Um, and then that was interesting talking about the guilt. So you can even work that into here, right? Looking at the guilt as being the, the uh, root of a lot of things too. Um, that's what I mean by comprehension. That's what I mean by self-observation. Not seeing these and going, yeah, that makes sense, but finding it yourself and going, okay, I see it. I see that I was doing that because of self-importance or because of guilt or because of fear. We have to remember that life is an extraordinary psycholog psychological gymnasium. We're put here for a purpose. Everything that happens to us, every person we run into, every obstacle, every hurdle in our life is there for us to learn something about ourselves. Remember the whole concept of return and recurrence. We keep living the same life over and over again with karma placing obstacles in our path to correct that behavior, to allow us an opportunity to perfect ourselves, allow us an opportunity to eliminate an ego and finally free our consciousness, allowing it to ascend back to the source, which is what it was supposed to do in the first place. We can go back to the source of all things, back to God, uh, Allah, the void, Zen, whatever you want to call it, it's all really the same kind of a, an expression. In relationships with our fellow man, fellow humanity, the defects that are hidden in the subconscious depths flourish spontaneously. Okay, that's why if we use people like a mirror, we can use that to reflect aspects of our own psychology. Things that we would never really see unless there was something to bring it out. If we're trying to work with self-observation, we can catch those defects and then meditate on them to discover their causes and effects. So rather than standing there condemning, judging, criticizing, or reacting to other people, we can use the manifestations of other people like a mirror to then search within ourselves for that behavior. Because every time you know we react to somebody else, we've then directed that and somebody else has reacted to us. So if someone's making us angry, at some point we've made somebody else angry. We carry the same things inside all of us. We're all the same. We all carry the same things. We just don't really see them and don't really observe them in ourselves to the extent that we can observe them in other people. We want to work towards changing that. Okay? Using other people as a mirror to search deep within inside of ourselves. We must self-observe constantly, that's what we're striving to do, and before criticizing others, criticize ourselves. Okay, instead of using that time and mental effort and the various energies to criticize and condemn other people, direct that internally and use it as an opportunity to, to learn more about ourselves. It is more useful to stop criticizing others and use the opportunities for self-discovery. And that's what lends us to the state of mind where we can turn the other cheek and do unto others and receive with gladness the unpleasant manifestations of our, of our fellow man. And that's something that would, if everyone was able to, to work just a little bit with this for just a couple weeks, we'd probably make the world a completely different place. If everyone was able to really understand that concept and work with it. We need to examine ourselves and discover that which we criticize in others also lies within ourselves to varying degrees and varying extents. Okay, we all have the ability to get angry and get jealous and that kind of stuff. Now, some people will take those emotions to different extremes. Some people will get angry and use that to, to commit a crime or murder. That doesn't mean that we'll go to that extreme, but it means we carry the same root of that behavior in ourselves. We just will manifest it in a different way. And by working to eliminate that root within ourselves, then we're going to be slowly changing all of humanity a little bit at a time. Just like Gandhi made the change that you want to see in the world. In order to correctly relate to others, we have to learn to correctly relate to ourselves. In order to turn the other cheek, we really have to take down that golden idol. We have to really see ourselves for who we are, and that is imperfect beings, but working towards perfection. That's the kind of the irony of the whole thing. We have this golden image, this idealized self-image of perfection, but the, you know, the irony of the whole thing is, is we could actually achieve real perfection, just like people like Jesus and, and, and Buddha taught us. It's possible to do that, but you have to go about it a certain way. And, you know, 
living in a strange state of denial and worshiping the false idol of the self isn't going to allow us to reach that conclusion. But if we're able to actually use that uh, uh, sense of, of self-observation, use that sense of identifying egos and working towards comprehending them and working toward eliminate them, then little by little we're coming closer and closer to that point of perfection. But while we're still clinging to that false idol, then you know, that golden image of the self, then we're not going to get to that point. As we progress in self, and sorry, in psychological self-observation, we become more and more conscious of ourselves. Remember, the time we spend questioning and asking and studying ourselves, that's like a workout for the consciousness. That's like the consciousness lifting weights, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The brighter that light shines, it's like a chain reaction. The more aspects we see of our psychology, so the more aspects we study, which in turn makes that light brighter, which shines even more, which allows us to see more, which allows us, to, it's like a, a mechanism that sustains itself. But it begins with such a simple thing, self-observation. It's, such, it's, it's the first step on the path. And once we get that ball rolling, and once we start learning a lot about ourselves, then we start drastically changing how we perceive ourselves and perceive the world around us, which is why the Greeks put so much stress on nasa te ipsum, know thyself, and thou shalt know the universe of the gods. When we start to create a realistic portrait of ourselves, we change the way we view the world and others around us. And it all begins with the self. We've got so many people running around trying to make the world a better place by telling other people what they're doing wrong. And trying to make things better for other people. But if everyone just took a different point of view and made themselves better, then we'd make everyone else better in the process. Which goes to your story about the, uh, the psychiatrist. Same idea. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> when Jesus went into the temple and threw out the money lenders, mm -hmm. How did uh, all that work? Do you want to know what that's a story about? The yeah. temple he went into was the mind, the moneylenders were the evil. So Jesus going into the temple and throwing out the moneylenders, that was an analogy for the consciousness eliminating the evils. Same thing with Jesus being born in the, in the manger, being born amongst the animals, that's an analogy for the consciousness lying amongst the egos. So when Jesus went in and chased out all the moneylenders, that represents things like envy, all those materialistic egos that we have. So we have to have our consciousness go in there like Jesus and kick all the freeloaders out of the temple, the temple being the body and the mind and the psychology. So we have to go in and chase the moneylenders out so only the divine resides. And the divine name of our house of God should be for God only. Well, we're basically the house of God, but there's all these you know, uh, uh, freeloaders kicking around in there, and those are the various egos. Okay, let's take a, a five-minute break or so, and then we'll do our meditation.